In this lesson, we are going to learn how to use calculus to find volumes of solids. Many of our solids are going to be things called the solids of revolution, and this will give you some insight as to why certain geometric formulas are what they are. So you know how to find the volumes of some standard solids like prisms, spheres, and cones. But suppose you want to find the volume of like a funnel or a pill bottle, and how are you going to do that? And so we're going to learn how integration connects the idea of area under a curve or between two curves to volumes of solids. So first, some quick review. So if you have a right prism, the area of that right prism is found by finding the area of the base multiplied by the height. So in this case, my base is some kind of like funky thing, but you could use calculus to find this area multiplied by the height. And that same definition applies to certain things that you know, like for a circular cylinder. So the base is a circle. You know, the area of a circle is pi r squared. There's the pi r squared times the height of h gives the volume. For a box, you know, the volume is length width height, but the same definition is true. The length times width gives the area those two dimensions, multiplied by the height gives the third. But what if you had a loaf of bread? This is a really wonky loaf of bread, but this loaf of bread, it's not a prism anymore. So your idea is, is you take your bread and you slice your bread into chunks and you assume each chunk is a prism. You know, bread slices are not exactly prisms, but they're approximately prisms. And so what you do is this, so first step is slice into a chunk. The approximate volume of a slice, the approximate volume, so we'll say the ith slice, v sub i, will be about equal to the area of a cross section of that slice times delta x. And then the total volume, so total V, will be about equal to a sum from I equals 1 to N of these V sub I's, which is a sum from 1 to N A sub I delta X. And then, just like in the previous thing, to find the volume exactly, we take a limit which makes this into an integral from your a to b. And the thing you're adding up are those areas. And then your delta x becomes a dx. So in this thing, a of x is the area of a cross section. So that's the very general formula. What we're going to talk about today is solids of revolution. The primary solid we're going to deal with in this class is called a solid of revolution. So how you form a solid of revolution is this. You take a curve, y equals f of x, and you spin it about an axis. For now, we're just going to spin it about the x-axis and between some value a and some value b. And so when that's done, here's kind of what it'll look like. So approximately like this. And you've got to think what will each cross-section look like? If you were to slice that up, what would your slices look like? You're slicing perpendicular to the x-axis. And if you think about that, every slice that you make is going to be a circle. So each slice is a circle. And think back to the formula that your volume was an integral from a to b, area of a cross-section. In this case, a of x is going to equal pi r squared because our cross sections are circles. And notice that the radius is this distance from there to there. So r will always equal the distance from your axis of rotation 
to your curve. So in this particular case, notice that r is equal to f of x. So the volume of a solid of rotation will be an integral from a to b pi f of x squared dx. And just the reason that there's a pi and your function is squared is because your cross sections are circles and you're using this formula to find the area of a cross section. We will have some examples where our cross sections are not circles but they're squares or equilateral triangles in which case you won't use pi r squared because your cross sections are not circles. Alright, let's do an example. So find the volume obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals 1 minus x squared, y equals 0, about the x-axis. So first, graph your region and indicate how it is being rotated. So 1 minus x squared is a parabola shifted up 1, that's upside down. It looks approximately like this. And we're going to rotate this region about the x-axis. So show me which axis you're spinning stuff around. Okay, now the that will look something about like this, kind of like football-ish with pointy sides, probably a little bit taller than a football. Now, the area of a cross-section will be pi r squared, and your radius is 1 minus x squared. So the volume of this solid will be the integral from negative 1 to 1, pi times 1 minus x squared, the quantity squared, dx. And because the function inside your integrand is even, you can do twice the integral from 0 to 1. Also, the pi can come out. Expand that 1 minus x squared, and we have 1 minus 2x squared plus x to the fourth. So now anti-differentiate, we'll have x minus 2 thirds x cubed plus 1 fifth x to the fifth. So that's 2 pi times 1 minus 2 thirds plus a fifth. And that's just a lot of arithmetic. So 15 fifteenths minus 10 fifteenths plus 3 fifteenths. That will give us 8 fifteenths times 2 pi is 16 pi over 15. So you think the area, the integral adds up all these areas with little mini volumes and results in a total volume. Now this method, this disk method, is can be used to prove certain geometric formulas. So for example, you've probably never been shown why the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the way you prove that is by using this disk method that we just learned. So first you need to find a curve that when you rotate it, it's going to give you a sphere. So if you were to have an equation for a semicircle of radius r, And if you take that semicircle and you spin it about the x-axis, that's going to make a sphere. So what you need now is an equation for a semicircle of radius r. One equation for a whole circle of radius r is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So y squared is r squared minus x squared. And technically, y equals plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared. To get just that top half, we're just going to use square root r squared minus x squared. And so the volume will equal the integral from a to b area of my cross section. Now my cross sections are going to be these little things, once they're spun they're going to be circles. So the area of my cross section will be pi, let's say capital R squared. Notice how capital R will equal the square root of lowercase r squared minus x squared. And my slices would begin at negative r over here, and they'd end at positive r. So the volume is the integral from negative r to r, pi times the square root 
r squared minus x squared, that quantity squared. Once again, we can use symmetry because the function inside the integrand is even. This is 2 pi integral 0 to r. And also squaring that square root just leaves you with r squared minus x squared. And recall that r squared is just a constant, so the antiderivative of r squared is r squared x. The antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x cubed, evaluated from 0 to r. Now plugging in r, we'll have 2 pi r cubed minus 1 third r cubed. Plugging in 0 yields 0. And 1 r cubed minus a third r cubed is 2 thirds r cubed, which makes 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that is how you prove the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now, next, suppose we want to rotate a region around the y-axis instead of the x-axis. What's going to have to change? So i got something like this, and I care about some y equals c to some y equals d. And we're going to spin around this axis instead. Well, in that case, you're going to have to slice this direction, so perpendicular to the y-axis instead. And in that case, your radius is going to be given as a function of y, or in other words, x equals something with y's, and you're going to have to solve for y. So what you're going to need to have is something in the form x equals f of y, and your lower bound the lowest y value and your upper bound is the highest y value. All right, let's do one of those. So find the volume obtained by rotating the region bounded by x equals 2 root y, x equals 0, and y equals 9 about the x-axis. So first, let's sketch a little bit of a picture. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, they're not evenly spaced at all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so we've got y equals nine up there. X equals zero, notice, is the y-axis. All right, two root y. Dyslexia prevents me from being very good at this split. I have to actually plug in numbers. Zero for y. 0 for x, 1 for y, 2 for x, 4 for y, 4 for x, 9 for y, 6 for x. So there's the region that's being rotated about the y-axis. So your slices are going to go horizontally, they're still going to be circles. Now note the radius of each slice is going to be the distance from your axis of rotation out to your curve, and that is given by x equals 2 root y. So to find the volume, you add all these slices up. They begin at y equals 0, they end at y equals 9, the area of each slice is pi times 2 root y quantity squared dy. So that's 4 pi integral from 0 to 9 y dy. Now the antiderivative of y is y squared over 2. So that's the same thing as 2 pi y squared, evaluated from 0 to 9. Or 2 pi times 81 gives us a total volume of 162 pi. So, so far all of our solids have been cross-sections that are circles. 
solid circles. Now, what if your solid has a hole in it? So like, what if the inside is carved out or something? How do you deal with this? So first, here is something that would produce such a solid. So suppose you took the region bounded by a straight line and a parabola, and you spun it about this axis. The resulting solid would look something like this, you know, assuming you can handle my drawing skills. And there's going to be this inner part too. So when you take cross sections, this is what your cross sections are going to look like if you were to cut it and then lie it down on the table. So your cross section would look like a circle with a hole inside. You need to figure out how do you find the area of that thing, of that circle with a hole inside. And the way you do that, you find the area of the entire circle, so R out meaning the outer radius, and you take away the inner circle. So area of the whole thing, subtract the middle. That is how you find the area of a cross section that's a circle with a hole in it. Note, this is not the same thing as pi times r out minus r in squared. That is pi times r out squared minus 2r out r in plus r in squared. It's not the same thing at all. So you have to think that the area of a circle with a hole in it is the area of the outer circle minus the inner circle, and therefore this is the area of that region. Okay, let's actually find the volume of that region. So the region R is enclosed by the curves y equals x, y equals x squared, and it's rotated about the x-axis. Find the volume of the resulting solid. So first, sketch a little picture. So there's the line y equals x. We'll say that's 1, that's 1. y equals x squared is below that line up until 1. So there's the region that we're going to spin about this axis, which produces something like this. Imagine that that's actually like just a you know, cross section of it, so it's being spun. We go. So approximately. So now the area of a cross section will be pi r out squared minus pi r in squared. So you can identify r out and r in. So r out is the distance from the axis of rotation to your outer curve. So r out equals x. R in is the distance from your axis of rotation to your inner curve, and that's x squared. And so your volume will be an integral from lowest, your slices begin at x equals 0, they end at x equals 1, pi r out, so x squared minus pi r in x squared squared. You know, take out the greatest common factor of pi. We've got the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared minus x to the fourth. And that integral is not too bad. So we'll have pi times 1 third x cubed minus 1 fifth x to the fifth. So that's the same thing as pi times a third minus a fifth which is pi times 5 fifteenths minus 3 fifteenths, or 2 pi over 15. All right, the last thing we're going to do is find volumes of a few regions that are rotated about an axis that's not the x or y axis. And these are all a little bit different. And we're going to explain them just with a few examples. But the best thing to think about is that r out is equal to the distance 
from your axis of rotation to your outer curve. And R in is the distance from axis of rotation to your inner curve. And I mean distance in the sense that this should be giving you sort of positive numbers if you think about plugging in various values for x. So here we go. So same region as before, but different axis of rotation. So y equals x, y equals x squared. But about the horizontal line, y equals 2. So somewhere up there is y equals 2, and that's the thing you're going to spin around. So the difference here is that the curved part of this graph is going to make up your outer edge, and the straight part is going to make up your inner edge. This is going to have a big gaping hole in it. So r out is the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer curve. That curve is the outer curve. Now notice that the distance from the x-axis up, that's the same thing as y equals x squared. The total distance from here to here is 2. So this distance that we're looking for right there, that's 2 minus x squared. Now r in, distance from axis of rotation to inner curve, similar idea, that distance is given by x. The total distance is 2, so r in is 2 minus x. And the hardest thing for these questions is figuring out what r out and r in are. The rest of it is just really tedious. So now our volume will be equal to an integral from our slices would begin at x equals 0, they end at x equals 1, pi times r out, so 2 minus x squared, the quantity squared, minus pi r in, 2 minus x, the quantity squared. Take out that pi, expand, so that 4 minus 4x squared plus x to the fourth minus the quantity 4 minus 4x plus x squared. I would strongly suggest combining like terms before you start to anti-differentiate. The fours cancel. We have positive x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4x. And now anti-differentiate everybody. So that will be 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 5 thirds x to the third plus 2x squared, evaluated from 0 to 1, or pi times a fifth minus 5 thirds plus 2 so a common denominator looks to be 15. So 3 fifteenths minus 25 fifteenths plus 30 fifteenths will give you 8 pi over 15. So that was about a horizontal line. Next, let's see what happens when we do a vertical line. And think that this horizontal line is kind of similar to the x-axis, since the x-axis technically is the line y equals 0 and is also a horizontal line. A vertical line will be more to rotation about the y-axis. So same region. Different axis of rotation. So there's your region, your axis of rotation is the line x equals negative 1. Okay, so r out, that's the distance from 
this axis of rotation, notice that the parabola is once again the outer curve. So the distance from here to here is one, as in one unit away. Now this distance from here to here, that's given by x equals square root of y. So in this case, r out is that distance of one to get to the y-axis plus square root y. Now r in, still got to go that distance of one and then all the way to the other curve, which is the same thing as x equals y. So r in is one plus y. And so our volume will equal an integral from 0 to 1. Notice that those are actually y values. It's just that these intersection points are 0, 0, and 1, 1. So the x and y values happen to be the same. Pi times r out squared. So 1 plus root y, the quantity squared, minus pi times r in, 1 plus y, quantity squared dy. If you want to factor the pi out right away, that isn't a problem. Okay, now expanding that all out, 1 plus root y, that quantity squared, will be 1 plus 2 root y plus y minus the quantity 1 plus 2y plus y squared. So once again, combine like terms. If stuff cancels, cancel it. We'll have 2 root y minus y minus y squared. So the antiderivative of 2 root y will be y to the 3 halves times 2 thirds minus 1 half y squared minus 1 third y to the third. Evaluate it from 0 to 1. So that'll be pi times 4 thirds minus 1 half minus 1 third. And 4 thirds minus 1 third is 3 thirds, or 1. 1 minus a half gives us 1 half. So this solid has a volume of pi over 2. Now thus far, all of our cross sections have been circles or circles with holes in them. Now how does this process change if our cross sections are some other shapes, such as squares, rectangles, or equilateral triangles? So in that case, this a of x function will equal something else. So for example, if your cross section was a square, a of x will equal side squared. So you're going to need to find an expression for the length of a side at some general place and square it. If you have an equilateral triangle, you can prove that the area of an equilateral triangle is root 3 over 4 side squared. I'm not going to make you memorize that, but you may have to use it in a homework. And if you've got a rectangle, there must be some relationship specified between the length and width of that rectangle. So suppose we have a solid with a circular base of radius 1. So here is the base. There's positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1. So it's a circle. And recall that that circle's equation is x squared plus y squared equals 1, or y squared equals 1 minus x squared. And the top half has equation y equals positive the root 1 minus x squared. And the bottom half has equation negative root 1 minus x squared. Now, this is the bottom of our solid, as in the base. And when you slice it like this, and you look at your slices, your slices will be squares. What this is, is like a fancy loaf of bread. You have a fancy loaf of bread, and you look at the bottom of it, and you see a circle. Now when you slice it, you get squares. And the squares on the ends are the ones for dieters. They're really, really small. And the squares in the middle are the one for all the bread lovers. 
big, huge squares that can take lots of Nutella. So what you need in this case, the area of your cross section is going to be side squared and this distance from your top of your circle to your bottom of your circle, that's how long each side is. So short sides, medium sides, biggest side in the middle, and then the sides, the length decreases. It's like your biggest slice of bread is in the middle, smallest ones on the sides. And notice that the equation for that side will be root one minus x squared minus negative root one minus x squared, or two roots of one minus x squared. And now to find the volume of your loaf of bread, you integrate from negative one to one, like your slices begin over here and they end over here. And you add up the area of each slice. Now the area of each slice is two root one minus x squared squared because each slice is a square. And so that gives you four times the integral from negative one to one of one minus x squared. The function inside our integrand is even, so we can use symmetry and make this eight integral, zero to one, one minus x squared. So that's eight times x minus one third x cubed, or eight times one minus a third, which is two thirds, Eight times two-thirds is sixteen-thirds. The key to remember, the whole reason you were using pi r squared before is because your cross-sections were circles. These cross-sections are not circles, they're squares. All right, let's do one more where we have cross-sections that are equilateral triangles. So this bottom picture is a picture of the base. And this is a picture of the solid that results. So what this says is that your, you have a solid, its base is bounded by these two curves, and the cross sections that are perpendicular to the x-axis are equilateral triangles. So as you can see in the picture, over here you get little bitty triangles. And over here on the y-axis, that corresponds to that, that's where the biggest triangle happens. So this is probably not a formula that you've ever been taught before, but the area of an equilateral triangle is square root three over four multiplied by the length of a side squared. You can prove that using the Pythagorean theorem. It's not very hard. I'm sure Wikipedia does it if you need to know where it comes from. So what we need to do is figure out what is the general length for the side. So the general length of a side will be given by 1 minus x over 2, that's the this number, minus whatever that number is, negative 1 plus x over 2. And so that's the same thing as 2 minus x. So that is how long a side is, and you can check here. That side, when x is 0, has length of 2. This side here, when x is 2, that side has length 0. And now my volume, I add up all of the areas. So I start adding at x equals 0. I stop adding at x equals 2. Each area is root 3 over 4 times 2 minus x, the quantity squared. That root 3 over 4 is just a weird constant. It factors out. Expand, and we have 4 minus 4x plus x squared. So now anti-differentiate. We have 4x minus 2x squared plus one-third x cubed from zero to two. So that's root three over four times eight minus eight plus eight-thirds, 
or root 3 over 4 times 8 thirds, which is the same thing as 2 root 3 over 3. So watch out for the things where the cross sections are not circles. It will occur, and I'm just testing, do you, are you understanding that the reason that you use pi r squared is because your cross sections are circles?